Hi, I'm Sam H. Freeman, one half of the writing directing duo behind Femme. Hi, I'm Ng Jun Ping, uh, the other half of the writing directing duo of the film Femme, uh, an erotic revenge thriller. Well, you can't turn around if you're a fucking man. You're letting them win. How do you want to deal with that? I think you're nice looking at them. On your front. I'm a nice guy. If you disrespect me, fuck you up. I get that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the same. Oh, yeah, man. You're a fucking big man! Best remember not to fuck with you then. Hi, welcome to the Teddy Award. My name is Jean Bourbobac, and this time we are discussing the film Fam. Hi guys, welcome to the Teddy, welcome to the Berlinale. Uh, we are very happy to have you here with us uh, today. Let's talk about Fam, let's talk about the film. Um, a few years ago, you made a short film with the same title that plays in a very similar world and operates with similar characters and similar power dynamics. Um, what sets these two works apart and how do they complement each other? Um, I think the feature for us, I suppose, is an evolution of the short. Mm. Um, as you said, they exist in similar worlds. They tackle similar themes. Um, and and there are definitely some similarities in the characters and the the, the dynamics between them, but um, I think this for us is yeah we 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 found the things that we found really interesting in the short that we felt weren't explored enough and and used those to create a new story with new characters um, and really sort of go a lot deeper into the things we were talking about in the short. I think the short is, it's a kind of 18 minute thrill ride, or that's that's how we saw it, um, that kind of touches on some things, but it's, you know, it's like high octane um, and you, the you know, the film's over before, before you get a chance to really know the characters. And so this time we kind of really wanted to delve into who these people are um, and, and, um, what it all means a bit more thoroughly, I suppose. Mm. Uh, which helped us to build a kind of entirely new plot um, and a new central dynamic, I suppose. Right. Let's talk um, about the, the the characters then, because you mentioned, and it's indeed it's a very character-driven work um, for a film like this, where like the characters are at the center and and the main driving force of the narrative. Obviously, casting is very essential. Can you talk a bit about the casting process and how did you find these two great actors who both delivered stellar performances? Um, in thinking about casting for Jules, we were very aware that it needs to be someone who can transform. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who goes from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum right. and to be equally authentic and, and persuasive in the different worlds that they, that this character has to go into. So it was, it was a, a long casting process in trying to find um, the exactly right person and mm -hmm. we feel that we have been given a gift in uh, Nathan Stewart Jarrett because he can embody the drag queen fiercely and wonderfully and at the same time embody uh, the masculine, hyper-masculine dominant uh, 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 undercover character that he, mm -hmm. he, he, he puts himself under and um that is the challenge and fun and excitement that we had in turn the cast jewels yeah um sam do you want to talk about yeah i was gonna say also nathan i mean he came into the process quite 
into the cost quite late in the process and actually it, it is such a i think it is a it's a really challenging role to play um and um i think kind of as soon as we met him and saw what he could do with it, it it's we suddenly went oh my gosh okay we can make yeah. a film yeah we I have a film five. <laughs> so that was yeah it was it's a challenge it's a really like tricky role and and the the kind of <laughs> what we've asked him to do and, and the challenge that the the script sets, I think is like, I think it's masterful what he does. Um, I mean, the other tricky thing, I think Sam is something that you talk about a lot as well, is that the character of Jules doesn't talk to anybody mm. in the film about his plan. Right. So really not just a, an actor who can transform to embody the two personas, but also someone who can communicate all those inner thoughts without words. Yeah. Mm. There are so many yeah. silent scenes of him where actually yeah. quite a lot is going on right. and he's, yeah. you know, he's got all these secrets. And and I think Jules as a character is also someone who does not talk about his feeling. Like he's not no. particularly open. He he keeps a lot Certainly. in. Um, and uh, yeah, Nathan just does it so well. Um, uh, and then Pre Preston, George is Preston. Um, we um i think we were big fan, fans of his work and and mm. and were aware that he is we felt so different in every single role that's part of what's so exciting about him he's always you kind of always go into a film being like oh this, we haven't seen you do this before yeah uh, and so what was exciting i think about the idea of george was that he felt very unexpected for the role. Like, I don't think he is the first person you would think of if you were like, like, cast this role now, top of your head, just who would you pick? Um, and yet his previous work made us feel very confident that he would be really good. Mm. Um, so um, I think that was kind of what excited us about it. And, you know, he read the script and we met him and he had just a lot of passion and excitement for it. Same as Nathan. Um, and so I think we felt like they would be great collaborators just because actually the, the sort of energy they wanted to bring to what is our first feature. You know, we don't have yeah. a track record. Um, there's not something that, you know, there's no like inbuilt appeal in working with the two of us. So it really had yeah. to find people who we knew were excited by the material. Right. Um, and so, yeah. And then, and then we kind of, we saw them together. They kind of instantly got along because they came in, you know, to sort of, do some work opposite each other for right. us um and yeah they they really like had this kind of instant chemistry with each other just as people which also kind of made us go it's got to be like this is this is it it's got to be these two mm. yeah and they became great friends on set and it was just wonderful to see them being friends you know before a take mm. you know clowning around and then suddenly when we say action they just click into the two characters and it was just yeah. fun and awesome, awesome to watch yeah definitely sounds like a an, an awesome process um that you had with them on set um let's look a bit deeper into into these two characters i think or at least for me preston's character was the one that was easier to kind of get it's a bit more often seen um this type of character and this kind of um inner problematic that he's uh, dealing with. Um, but I felt like that Jules is on a, on a really interesting psychological road in this, in this movie. I was wondering if you consulted any professional regarding the journey that he's taking um, in this film, if in any way that influenced um how the script developed maybe or how you thought about this character but yeah like maybe just like guide us through a bit um like what is happening with jules and the choices that he that he makes and and what motivates these these choices um i think um the reason why jules is the protagonist of the film the main character as you said Preston maybe is uh an archetype that we might feel more familiar right. with especially in 
films of this genre, which is kind of why we wanted to make this film. We wanted to to flip that dynamic and go, actually, no, this is the character that we're interested in putting in the driving seat of a kind of a, a, a revenge thriller. Yeah. Um, that that you know there is sex and violence and all of these things that quite often belong in in films where it's usually kind of quite butch straight men mm -hmm. who are in the driving yeah. seat um so we i think we really i think jules's journey in it is so much of the film is about power power and identity um and i think we wanted to create a character whose desire to even the score and take revenge equals what we expect of like straight men in these in these kind of movies and not you know um so i think that's it we wanted to delve into his rage and not his victimhood um and into his yeah desire to like to to take back power yeah um and i think i think that's what makes him feel like a unique protagonist i think in film because i i don't know that that that's usually where we, we're used to seeing queer characters go yeah i was um i was wondering because now you very nicely pointed it out that it's a lot is about identity and a lot is about like performing certain identities um which which is obviously like a very complex set of predicaments in 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 this film um but i was i was wondering if you can untangle a bit this um particularly the the way how gender is performed by these characters within the film and how that um sort of connects with these shifting and very intense power dynamics between between the two characters i think um drag the idea of drag which ultimately when we were sort of again developing the, the plot the story from the short because we wanted to to we didn't want to take the story of the short and turn it into just a yeah. longer version we wanted a new story and initially the, the the idea of drag um partially was kind of a, a plot device so that jules could be unrecognizable when he re-meets preston preston doesn't know that it's this guy we've seen before because the drag is a form of the yeah. skies and then i think what we realized and became really excited about um is that actually drag is really like at the heart of the film the idea of a performance of gender identity which is what drag is um is kind of what everyone in the film is doing including especially preston and Absolutely. his friends um in a way they are they're drag kings um and oh. and so obviously there's this much more familiar form of drag that jules is wearing at the beginning of the film which is then taken from him and then this form of revenge that he plots on Preston is in a way to strip Preston's drag from him and reveal what's underneath in the same way that Preston does to him at the beginning of the film. And so we were very conscious of this idea of kind of putting the performance of gender and particularly in this film, I think performance of kind of traditional ideas of masculinity and what it is to be a man at the forefront of the story. Um, so it, every time we were thinking about the characters, not just Preston, but Oz, his kind of friend mm. is, you know, the ultimate drag king, really. It's all, all of it is a performance. And actually what is underneath that performance, Jules exposes it as a performance when he realizes that he sort of brings his skills as a drag queen into Preston's world and goes, okay, I get what this is. This is drag. You're all doing drag and right. I can do that too. And I'm going to use that talent that I have in order to get what I want. And so sort of forms a new drag identity for himself and therefore exposes it all as being kind of a performance and not real. Yeah. Um, I mean, stop me if I am giving away too much of the plot, but it just feels like every major plot beat, I mean, any major plot event yeah. in the film is about a performance of gender, but a performance of a of, of a type of masculinity or or femininity that is at its heart about trying to preserve or or acquire or to regain power. And you know what Preston did to Jules in the first encounter yeah. is you know Preston feeling threatened, his 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 sense of of masculinity feeling Preston and he has to up his performance of that 
that leads to violence. And Jules' performances of masculinity is part of him trying to regain his power, you know, because in that performance, he's able to get into the life of, of, of his attacker yeah. uh, to infiltrate, to go undercover, you know, what you will, you know, in a very, I suppose, in a very archetypal kind of undercover revenge plot. But in that, he forms quite a complicated relationship with, with, um, the power that he gains or senses by putting on that performance. Yeah, right. And it was also very interesting to see, I mean, in one of the key scenes in the film, um, where finally Jules is somewhat opening up um, to his friends about what happened and how he felt after after the attack, is it's very interesting how he explains that um, he kind of didn't feel worthy anymore of uh, performing as Aphrodite, the drag persona um, that he that he inhabits on on stage, um, and that really made me think that okay, like these performances, uh, any kind of gender performance or drag, as we as we have just discussed, it really comes with a with a lot of power. Um, he really felt powerful as Aphrodite and very powerless after the attack, just as Jules without Aphrodite um, being part of, of, of his life. Um, and somehow um, the same is happening with Preston, but for him, this hyper masculine performance, this kind of like drag queen king performance is like a trap that keeps him in a very dark and vulnerable uh, place. So can we talk a bit about how you approached uh, visually um, kind of portraying these, these interesting uh, power dynamics that come with the performance of gender in the film? I suppose in a, in a I mean, just as the first viewing of the film, it's just how they look as characters. Yeah. Um, Jules is um, a, a, a drag, you know, the, the, the feminine drag persona. It is something that's very powerful, very fierce, mm. very confident. Um, and that confidence is rooted in this uh, a, a portrayal hyper um, hyper femininity. Yeah. You know, um, the way he performs on stage and also the way he behaves in his first proper encounter with Preston, the way, you know, he teases him, yeah. you know, that is rooted in a kind of performance of the kind of femininity that, that, that he feels gives him power. Um, with Preston, as, as you have mentioned before, it is something very familiar to us, you know, it's the gym body, it is the tattoos, it is the... It is the anger. In fact, anger as an emotion is part of of his drag, you know, because anger gives you lots of power and lots of control, or at least a sense of control over uh, the situation. Um, that is as much as we can say, I suppose, about the uh, what it looks like, the, the the what the characters look like. Um, Sam, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we did. We definitely like everything when we were building the characters, we were thinking about like, what is the drag persona always? Yeah. Mm. Um, it was really like useful kind of core point for us to always go back to what's the drag, what's the drag, what's the drag. Um, and, and, and I think, I think the actors enjoyed that as well. Like we would always talk in that language. Um, so yeah i think there's also you know there's the camera work at certain points in the film the way that we you know kind of frame them so that the the um how they their bodies looking you know wh where they are positioned and yeah. and and their heights and their relative sort of size and stature at different points in the film and um 
I mean, a lot of that is also, I suppose, really the performances. Like, I think Nathan and George really, really transform themselves so well to kind of fit the needs of each part of the film. And I suppose that's that's a visual that they bring themselves with their bodies. Um, so, no, I, mean, in I terms, think... In terms of composition, I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes still, we hope often deliberately, but sometimes accidentally. Um, there are lots of mirror shots where... You know, right. to, to, to tell the story of how the power has shifted between the two of them. Um, if, you pay atten- um, if you look at it, um, I hope that people notice that in the early parts of the film, uh, it is always, you know, Nathan against the wall and and Preston over him. But then, you know, in the late in the later part of the film, we flipped it and mm. it's almost shot for shot, a yeah. mirror of how the composition gives us the power imbalance. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yeah, that definitely that came that through, be, and there was there was a lot of lot of this interesting mirroring between the first half of the film and the second half of the film as well, which was obviously very nicely emphasizing this power shift that's uh, that's occurring through the progression of the of the narrative. Um, what was also very interesting to me, and we could talk a little bit about it, is like the space and sound in which the characters move, like the different spaces that they inhabit. I mean, there is a very stark difference between the flat where Preston lives and the flat where Jules is living. There is a very um, interesting... Um, stylistic difference between the two or the sauna the club um like can you talk a bit about how you constructed these different spaces and then how you layered sound onto it to kind of further prop all the the emotional <laughs> aspects of of these characters we definitely wanted to um there's a big contrast in where Jules lives and where Preston lives and we definitely talked at the beginning about Preston living in um you know he lives in a cage in a way that yeah. of his you know of his own sort of of his own making i suppose it's it's made by the world that he exists in but we wanted preston's living space to feel much more confined mm. like there's a there's very very tight corridors and actually i think the 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 main corridor in preston's flat that they walk through is actually measured to be the absolute minimum size that a corridor in a living space can be in the uk like our, okay. our production designer found exactly like to keep it we're not moving into the abstract where you're like this is surreal but like yeah. it is absolutely you cannot go a, an inch um uh narrower than yeah. that corridor and that's sort of what we wanted to play hmm within his space whereas Jules live kind of this like guardianship property is how we see it but it's this huge kind of like um uh open space yeah. um that they have kind of um made into a home you know <clears throat> it feels very queer in that way that it's sort of a found space that they've transformed into uh to fit the way that they, they want to live yeah. um and so there feels it's a lot less um oppressive yeah, yeah definitely one of the biggest contrasts between the preston flat and the jules apartment is um like sam says very narrow corridors very very straight lines and really there is only one way to move through the flat yeah um because there are corridors and there are boxy rooms and uh the colors are very specific colors it's quite um monochromatic um, we want the flat to express how, like, you know, really um, consciously performing masculinity kind of men want their flat to look like, mm. you know, it's about as was money and it's about showing off. Whereas um, Jules' flat is essentially a big open space and it's mm. endlessly customizable. And if you look at it, you can see little islands of of activity in that flat you know there's a sewing machine in the middle of it and then there's a kitchen that blends into the living area and there are many different ways of moving through the space yeah. um so it's more fluid it's more adaptable um and that is how we think how the two spaces um kind of serve as visual metaphors for 
how they see gender identity, mm. how on the one hand, gender identity is fluid and adaptable and that is their form of power, whereas in Preston's world, gender identity is is strictly hierarchical. You know, if you don't win, you lose. Um, right. um, there is only one way to be a man and um, that is reflected in how that space is designed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very nice. Um, just as a final question and maybe this doesn't give too much away uh, of the plot either um, but after the end of this movie um, where do you see or where do you hope that these two characters are <laughs> uh, where the characters are okay I was say, <laughs> what you want the audience to feel at the end of the film and i was going to say conflicted <laughs> would be my one word answer no um, no I, I think the question is what we often ask you know and then we keep saying yeah. that five years later where's preston is he in a club with a boyfriend watching yeah. on stage yeah, 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 yeah. in drag and we think maybe not I yeah don't know. let's i mean i suppose let's be careful not to give away too much about i suppose yeah, yeah. but yeah. um where do we see them? I mean, I think, um, I suppose, like the, the in a way, there isn't a, like the film does not offer like really hard resolutions, which is something that we were Certainly. conscious of wanting to do with the story, weren't we? Like the film there, this film is not Ping and I telling people how they should see the world or how things should be. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess trying to examine our feelings about certain things. And um, so I think, I mean, I think, how do we talk about, yeah, where they are? Without the the giving film, away the end away. of the film. Um, I think um, it's very complex. <laughs> well, are they in a better place or in a, in, in a worse place it's, than uh, where we um, left them? Like, essentially, do they recover from the end of the film? But even that is kind of like trying to... It might give away something because... Especially for those people who have seen the short. Mm, okay, who, yeah. Who yeah ex that's true. Expect, who expect the, the, the feature to go somewhere into that yeah. area as well. Mm. I would say that... Um, yeah, I'd say... Gosh, are they in a better or worse play? I think that is actually... I would say that is up to everyone's interpretation. Of the <laughs> film. That's okay, a cop out. Okay. Well, but I would say, good. like, it, it, that is very. I think that would be that the answer to that for either or both uh, characters, or you know, for for at least one of them. Uh, um, okay, no, 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 no. Let, let, let's give the let's give, give the non cop out answer. It is um, if we knew, or if we wanted to say what it was. The film would, would have been longer. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, we maybe. stopped. We stopped the film where inside ourselves the story stopped. Okay, you but wanted you, a, you wanted yeah. to I leave them in that in that spot, and then yeah. we can deal with it. To I think yeah, further. Yeah. <laughs> I think okay. We, I think we wanted to leave some space for the audience at the end of the film, for sure. I think that is how it's that's where it's kind of pitched at. I think. Um, yeah no for sure that, that's obviously and that's very clear as well if if someone watches the film till the end that yeah it's kind of up to each other i was just wondering where because obviously you also developed probably some sort of emotional relationship with these two characters since you've been together with them for quite a while until like developing this project and shooting and bringing it to audiences so but yes it's all it's 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 totally um fine if you if you just want to leave it up up to the audience well i i, I mean I the film the film is a tragedy isn't it the film is a tragedy it yeah, certainly yeah, is that's what i was gonna just about to say yeah, yeah. It has a tragic it's shape really, so the end of a tragedy is the end of yeah tragedy. we would call it we definitely i think would feel comfortable calling it we see the film as as a tragedy yeah yeah cool okay great thank you so much uh for being here with us um, I wish you all the best uh, for the festival and hopefully the film reaches a wide audience and um, yeah, all the, all, all the best for you. Thank you. Thank you so much.